Allen. Okay, we're here on the Comfortably Zone Radio Network, uh, three baseball machuganers. Uh, I'm Alan Blumkin, and with me tonight are Ralph Tycho and our uh, usual Sunday night guest, Peter Golenbach. How are you, gentlemen? We're fine, thank you. Fine. Thank except, you. of course, except of course for the for the uh, recent election. Aside from that. Ah, uh, yes. Outside of that, Mrs. Lincoln, how is the play? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, Alan, you asked me a question off air. This is kind of a personal thing. There was a there was a big fire last night. It was in a warehouse right close to where I live. I live in Alameda, which is a little island off of Oakland, and. Um, big warehouse fire it was a rave party and it was in a in a residence that was n- not only not zoned for parties or anything like that but it had um it had tenants living in, in the um art um studios and they had live-in tenants it wasn't zoned for that and it was in a state of reconstruction and it was, the wires were all screwed up and it was a big rave party and there was one entrance in and one entrance out tragically a fire started and um uh, at least 22 people have been um uh, deemed no longer with us they how did the fire really. start? How, how did it start? They don't know yet, and they really can't investigate as much as they'd like. It's taking a long time to investigate because the structure of the building makes it unsafe to even go out and bring bodies out. So wow. they had a. Um, but my big bugaboo on Facebook all day, locally in the Alameda community, which has a tremendous disparity between the rich and the poor, as does yeah. in uh, in the world. And the renters, the it's not just Alameda, it's the entire Bay Area. We experience it here because there's absolutely no rent control in Alameda. And landlords are making it so that starving people, people... Working people have to live in conditions they're happy to have a roof over their head for an exorbitant amount of money that that they'll charge for a loft in these places that not only are not safe, but um, they've been investigated by the city agencies. And city agencies write a little report. There's a lot of trash around that's combustible, but nobody does anything. And wow. there's there's a catch-22 as well because there's a lot of these buildings and structures around to keep uh, um, a reasonable – keep the, the homeless down is what I call it. Um, right. And it just, um, this is just a microcosm of it all. And there are two ways of looking at it. The city can go in and say, well, this is unsafe and evict the people. You know, we can't have these people. Now you get more people on the street. So people are living in horrible conditions um, because of, the overwhelming greed of the incredibly rich landlords in in the Bay Area who think this bubble is going to last forever. Remember, um, these jobs and, and all this, it's all based on, uh, on startups and Google doing this. And, uh, I mean, Northern California, we're uh, – Totally, in, there's no production. All it is 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 the internet. It's Google and uh, yeah, right, eBay sure. and and all this stuff. Well, those jobs are going to go bye bye yeah. eventually when people when there's no money to feed 
the middle class, and they start to revolt. And there's going to be a revolution. Um, we, I don't know if it, you talked about the election. I think people, I, I misjudge the amount of people who hate this guy and hate the idea that this is going to be the mindset of, of our country for four years. Um, that's my rant. <laughs> wow. Did you, did you see what um, the Texas legislature did today? No. They 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 cutting cutting food stamps for the disabled. Cutting food stamps for the disabled. Well, that's yeah. a. I thought food stamps was a federal program. I did. I don't know how much. I'm, the I'm state trying. I'm, has. I'm I'm trying to come and find the exact the exact thing here. Whether it's food stamps. Yeah, or some I'm sort of, sure the state some kind of have some control o yeah. over it. With, um. I We're certainly fine. deal with the state when I get my food stamps to supplement my Social Security. I'm not ashamed to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I told the friends of mine that uh, not to be surprised by anything Trump does because he has no bottom. And it's like I used to say when I was in the Army, uh, every time I thought they reached their highest stupidity, they always managed to surprise me. Yeah. Here it is. Texas Republicans killed Medicare funding for kids with disabilities in Texas. The okay, that's not take, food stamps. Right. That's 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 Medicaid. The funding that's, cuts that's take worse. Place, <laughs> that, yes, that's <laughs> worse. <laughs> yes. Will will take place ten days before Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Unbelievable. And he, was, he isn't that, even that, president that, yet. We'll give Texas oh no, and he's already dealing with Taiwan, yeah. <laughs> which mm -hmm. nobody nobody's dealt with in, since 1979. So what you're going to do is you're going to piss off China, and you're going to end up having trade wars and and stuff. This is this is some serious shit on so many different levels. I'll be surprised that, by it. Um, that, and his appointees, his, his crazy, crazy appointees. Uh, well, scary. the problem is we could probably spend the next hour talking about this. Yeah. And okay. my guess is Let, that the people, yeah, the people who could, and, think uh, about uh, listen to start talking about this? baseball. You want me to start off? No, with no, let's, yeah. get, let's get right into it. I want to talk, I want to pay homage to someone who is um, a big part of the book that you wrote, Peter. He's yeah. uh, now the late Ralph Branca. Yeah. Um, who had an illustrious life? Let's put it that True. way. True. He's still he's still a tragic figure. However, clearly to okay. me he is a tragic figure. Uh, at age 21, Ralph Branca, I believe it was in 1947 when the Dodgers won the pennant, won 21 games, and he was a star. No two ways about it. Ralph was a star. And then in 1951, in the in the playoff game. The final game of the season, it was the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Giants. And in the bottom of the ninth inning, uh, Ralph came in in relief of Don Newcomb to face Bobby Thompson, and he threw him a meatball. And the polo grounds is such that Thompson only had to hit the thing about 265 feet, but he hit it on a line drive, and it cleared the um, – it, it, it cleared the bleacher line, and it went into right. the stands. And, and the home run defeated the Dodgers and, and broke all of Brooklyn's heart. I mean, I know people who were alive back then who still have never gotten over it, which is amazing. Right. All those years They later, used to call that a Chinese home run. They did. Uh, that was they quiet. used to call it that. It, it, it was a home run. run. It wasn't it on was a level of Dusty Rhodes hit in the, the first game of – 1954. Yeah, so he had Chinese home runs too. Yeah, but uh, but but that's what he will always be remembered for. And you know, there's a you know, few like, like Billy Buckner, full hitters at Yankee Stadium who hit some yeah. Chinese home runs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but, well, but uh, yeah. he had to live with that for the rest of his life. He told right. me that he would go into a, a, a supermarket and uh, people would give him the stink eye. It just it just so, just wasn't was not well, easy for him for many years. He gave everybody a lesson on how to handle it. Without a doubt. 
Yeah, because I, I read Mark Littell's book, and Littell gave up the home run in 1976. Uh, I was there. And Yankee Chris Chambliss. Chris mm-hmm. Chambliss. And Mark yep. Littell gave Chambliss a couple of pages in his book. Oh. And I, I once went to a book signing. Bobby Thompson came out with this book in 1991. The Giants right. win the pen. The Giants win the pen. And they did right. joint book signings. And I uh-huh. went to one of them, and uh, there was a bookstore in, uh, rest in peace, the Lake World Trade Center. Right. And they were both very, very gracious. And, uh, you know, Ralph uh, Branca gave a lesson to everybody on how to handle, you know, that kind of adversity. He certainly did. Yeah. He certainly did. Lovely, and lovely man. And he found out, too, that... The Giants did indeed have a system where they were relaying. They had uh, Herman Franks was in in the clubhouse with a binocular, not a binocular, a telescope, and he. They did this. The Giants, the last two months of the season, they knew which, what pitches were coming, and a fellow by the name of Sal Evars mm-hmm. told the story, and. Um, it came out in the book. It's a, the book is written by can't think of his name. The book is called Echoing Gr- Echoing yeah. Green. Echoing Green. And it was written by a fellow that was that's a writer for the Wall Street Journal, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. And um, beyond a doubt, he did uh, extensive research. Talked to Bobby Thompson. Talked to. Bobby Thompson knew what pitch was coming. Now, as Sal Magley said, and I quote, you should have thrown a curveball, they go. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is the Yankees also had a system. One of their players, and I can't remember exactly who it was at the moment, one of the pitchers, I believe, was expert. I think it was Bob Turley. I think it was Bob Turley. Was, was it Turley? Well, Turley knew exactly what was coming, and he would whistle and let – People, especially Mantle, know whether it was going to be a fastball or a curveball. What Mickey said, though, was that not everybody wanted to know. Because sometimes right. when you knew what was coming, you were too jumpy. You, you, you were too quick to the ball. And, and you weren't as good as you were when you didn't, didn't know. So oh. it, it's, you know, I'm sure with, with, the, with the Dodgers and the Giants, that some of the Giants used it and some of the Giants didn't use it. But As a matter of so, fact, Peter, in this book, he lists, yeah. the author lists the players who wanted to know and, like you say, s- some didn't want to know. I think mm-hmm. Mays didn't mind knowing. I, um, yeah. Mays was a rookie. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he was on deck, as a matter of fact. Yeah. That was, um, he was. He was on deck when he hit it. Bobby Thompson hit a home run off Frank in the first playoff game. That's that right. wanted up his field where the Giants won three to one. So there was also the question of who to bring in and whether or not changing catchers. Campy wasn't playing. I think he had a right. pulled muscle or well, something. Yeah, he was hurt. He had muscle and the yeah. foul, the foul uh, territory was fairly uh, substantial there. Right, and there's also, the school of thought that if you br- if you brought Campy in. For that last inning, he probably could have gotten Branca through it. Um, yeah, but you can't do more. that. You don't Probably do that. Yeah, that well, a couple of on. things. First of all, the Dodgers had Carl Erskine and Branca warming up in the bullpen. They were starters. Right. The reason they were warming up is that uh, Dressen had wrecked his relief pitching. Mm-hmm. Big reliever for the year was Clyde King, who came down with a sore arm because of overuse, and uh, Dressen wouldn't pitch Clem Labine the last month because Labine ignored a sign of his and gave up a grand slam home run uh, right. to Ned Jones in the game with the Phillies earlier in September, and he was forced to start Branca, the, I mean, Labine the second game of the playoffs, and Labine pitched a shutout. So he wasn't right. going to be available for the third game. Mm-hmm. So he had no relief pitchers, and you bring in pitchers that are not used to Relieving, it's it's a it's a tough deal. A yeah. very tough deal. Very and tough. also the other thing with you interviewed with that, Peter, you interviewed a relief pitcher. I think it's Priscilla or something. you interviewed his wife. He had passed Bud away. Bailey. What Bud Bailey? Oh, Bud Bailey. Yes, Bailey. that. I'm doing. 
Yeah, Bud Pot Bill. Um, yeah. And I, he, she made a case that he thought that uh, he should have come in. That would have been another option. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and here, here's the kicker to all of it. After the book comes out, they some guy gets on the internet and finds some immigration news about Branka's mother, who yeah. he thought, and she came off as to the family, as an Italian woman. Correct. Well, she wasn't. She was Jewish. No. Yes, she was. And, <laughs> yes. And it comes out, like he's about 86 at this time when it comes out. That's right. All of That's a true. sudden, this guy <laughs> who goes to Mass, he's a, I mean, he's he was. He, he was a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic. He went to marriage. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he, he comes to find out, after having lived with that, as you say, it's like a cross to bear. People look, give him the snake eye. And then, and of course, they come to find out he's a... Jewish. Yeah. Right. Now he's Jewish. <laughs> yes. Not only did he give up the home run, but he's Jewish. Yes. He's Jewish. <laughs> but, so he zoomed up. He, he also is among the winningest all-time Jews ever. I think Sandy's probably the, the winningest. Right. And maybe and yet Sandy, winning. as you know, Sandy only had about 150 wins. That's a funny thing. 165. Right. And, 165, uh, yeah. Was second, Holtzman. Yeah, Holtzman was second, right. Yeah. And uh, they and came I out think he might be third at this point. Was still, um, and he was brought up straight. They, his parents separated soon after he was born. And he was brought up uh, as a strict Catholic. Who's that? I didn't know they separated. I didn't know. I know they probably couldn't get divorced. I mean, that. Who Woodrow was brought up Catholic. Oh, mother, no kidding. And his mother was Jewish. Wow. This wasn't known until. But I don't uh, think uh, they. I don't think the family knew it when he was growing up. They didn't. The, I don't think the mother really led on to anybody. Probably not. Probably not. It's on the internet, but it's kind of a. I kind of feel for the guy because you got to be used to being Jewish. You got to be from an early age. You can't, you can't bring it on you when you're an old man. Woo! It's good the good the bad and the ugly, but you you have to have strong shoulders. Let's put it that way. Oh. Yeah. Um, what about Branca? That. Oh, I wanted to mention one other thing. Branca was instrumental in starting and funding BATS. Yes, he was. Program that Major League Union, the players uh, get together and they take care of indigent players, coaches. See, there's uh, another way of looking at BATS. Another way of looking at BATS. I I think, quite frankly, that BATS, in a way, is a disgrace. Because what you have is you have these players who come to bat on their hands and knees begging for money. And it seems to me that baseball, which is a $10 billion uh, sport, should not have to make them do it. Every player should be getting, every player who ever played, even if they played one day, should be getting some size, some kind of significant pension. And if they were getting a significant pension, and I know quite a few of these ball players who don't get any pension whatsoever, and, and as a result of that, they had to go begging to bat. And I just think that's terrible. Well, it's not the player's fault, of course. It's the, it's the system's fault. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying whose fault it is. I'm just saying that baseball, with a capital B, should not be uh, running an organization where its former players have got to get on their hands and knees and beg for money. Terrible. Yeah. Um, I think you have to have five years of it at that point. Four or five years into the pension you right. know, service to qualify for the pension. At the, at Something the like that. And, yeah. and there, there are plenty of players who... Uh, Bill Dennehy, who I just who wrote, I wrote a book with a couple of years ago, Bill Dennehy okay. right now he's living. Who was traded? Li- Bill Dennehy traded for, traded Gil, for Gil, Gil Hodges. Hodges. I didn't. Traded for I Gil didn't Hodges. Know about that. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, Dennehy, he, uh, he pitched for the Mets. He pitched for Washington. He pitched for a couple other teams, but he was not in the league long enough to get a pension. And and he had about 40, 45 uh, uh, shots where they shot into his, his, his knees and his arms, um, and the shots made him blind. And, oh. um, you know, he doesn't get a pension, and it's terrible. And he's just one of many. One of many. Wow. Yeah. Permanently blind. Cortisone, cortisone, cortisone shots is what he was getting. Yeah. Oh, that's shocking. That's why Colfax quit, because he was taking uh, a lot of cortisone shots in his last year or two. That's right. I was afraid of the permanent damage it would do. Well, he was smart. Yeah. He was, uh, I I don't think there was a pitcher that was more dominating for a five-year period, five, six years, than Koufax. It was unbelievable. He just, um... He was the best I ever saw. Yeah. The only one who comes to mind uh, to me uh, for that period of time was Lefty Grove. And and contrary to popular belief, I was not old enough to see him. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there there have been pitchers who have had had runs like that. Yeah. So you got to say, say that, that Bob Gibson for for his short run. Yeah. You know, Gibson was was somebody who who really didn't lose very much at all. Uh, you know, the fabulous the fabulous Braves, uh, Milwaukee, no, uh, Atlanta oh, Braves. Yeah. No, Atlanta Braves pitcher Spawn, yes, Spawn, absolutely. But the Atlanta Braves pitcher, the, the the heart of that of that Atlanta Braves pitching staff, um, you'll think of his name. He was just wonderful. He didn't throw the Maddox. ball more than eight. Maddox. Maddox. Greg Greg okay. Maddox. Greg Maddox was just for for four, five, six years. He was just something to behold. He was just wonderful to watch. So was Pedro Martinez for a few years. Yep. So was Pedro Martinez yeah. for a few years. Absolutely right. Yeah. Right. I enjoyed okay, watching so, Whitey. On the, I enjoyed uh, and Whitey. Whitey. Whitey was the yeah. second best pitcher I saw. Whitey was the second best pitcher I saw. Whitey, Casey Stengel used to save Whitey for the best teams. He didn't pitch Whitey all that much against the Washington Senators or the Kansas City. He would he would pitch him against the the, the Chicago White Sox, the Baltimore Orioles, Detroit Tigers. He would he would hold Whitey for the the good teams. Yeah, in 1960, well, I was going to say, in 1961, yeah. when Ralph Houck took over for the very first time, he said to Whitey, I'm going to start you every fourth day. I'm not going to fool around with you the way Casey did. And Whitey went out and won himself, what, 25 games? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's you know. very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, Whitey pitched in big in the World Series, too. That's another oh. thing. Oh, you. I mean, Huge. Incredibly big. Oh, yeah. I know. I, you know who else was very good in the World Series? The guy with the bloody sock. Oh. Schilling, yeah. Schilling. Yeah. Schilling. And, uh, Say what you want about Schilling. I do believe that he belongs in the Hall of Fame, not for his politics, but because he was a damn good no. pitcher when it counted most. That did come to mind. His politics did come to mind. Absolutely. I don't doubt it. I but, know. but I'm sure, you know, when people think of us, they say our politics come to mind because about 47.5 percent of the people would say that yes right we're so yeah. polarized oh and no it's it's incredible um, it's funny I, I i said to my wife the other day that we we're becoming like the shiites and the sunnis and she said we're not because the shiites and the sunnis have a re- religious affiliation yeah, and really what we have is not religious numbers. They've and she's right. Each other since 700. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're right. But but the enmity between the two groups in America is growing. Oh, yeah. And I don't know why people aren't embarrassed, simply embarrassed to have this man, more people. Well, let's just say the four, a big percentage of the 47%. And every woman that voted for this guy, I just cannot believe it. That's it. You take a, I don't know how this guy got elected, but women voted for him and Hispanics voted for him. 
that it, yeah, I, I, I don't particularly well, want to get into it because it's, yeah. it's, it's unbelievably complicated what yeah, happened. We're off topic. What happened was the perfect storm of, of crap, and, and, and the Russians had a lot to do with it, and this guy Comey had a lot to do with it, and I hate to tell you that Bernie had a lot to do with it, and Jill Green had a lot to do with it, and, of course, of, uh, of course the Democrats – have, have well, never say, figured out. Instead of saying Bernie, why don't you say Debbie Wasserman Schultz? Yeah, that's about what I was about to say. Naming it on yeah. Bernie. Oh, yeah. But the, the funny Democrats. thing is it's all of them. It's every the one of them. Democrats reelected Pelosi minority. Yeah, group. yeah. No, I know. That's I mean, the, 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 the three Democrats right now who, are, who have the most power, including Howard Dean, are all 90 uh, or are, are all 70 years old. You need people yeah. in the 30s. You need people in their 40s to run the run the, the, the party, not 70 year olds. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I I can't even I just right. I can't yeah. even talk about it. Going I back can't to Ralph even talk Frank. about it. Going back to Ralph, Dr. Ralph Branca. Yeah. Another another thing with him is that he uh, was one of the few that really befriended Jackie Robinson. He did. Robinson came he up in 1947. Did. Yeah. He did. He was a very decent guy. Very decent. Of course, and he was from. He was from, you know. Yeah, he went to NYU. Yeah, hey, he, I think he was teammates with Eddie Yost at NYU. I think that's right. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Did not know that. I yeah. um, Mount Vernon, New York. Yep. Up above the Bronx. Yep. Mount Vernon, New York. Yeah. Now, he was one of a ton. How many brothers and sisters did he have? I think he had like thirteen like, or fourteen. At least six or seven. At yeah, least, at least nine. it was. It was. Yeah, there was a, a lot of brothers and sisters. The right. mother spent a lot of time being pregnant. Yeah, right. That, well, uh, again, that's uh, that's part of the tradition. Yeah, he heard his uh, his back. Uh, so after after the in 1952, uh, he he wasn't really able to continue. Uh, well, see, that's what him. people don't realize, how, yeah. how injured he was in spring training in 1952. And, and that's part of the sadness, that, the way Ralph tells the story, or told the story, is, is that people didn't realize that the home run that was hit against him had nothing to do with his lack of success everywhere. But that back injury that he suffered in the spring training of 1952 was, was what did him in for the most part. And he sort of had a very sort of mediocre rest of his career. Yeah. You know, he handled it well, but once he found out that Thompson knew what pitch was coming, yeah. um, he, it embittered him quite a bit. And to his, uh, for whatever reason, Thompson didn't really cop to it until that book, until an, uh, a real heart-to-heart -heart interview. Thompson was a bad uh, Yeah, but I, Ralph, I, well, I can tell you, he threw a crappy pitch. Threw, well, yeah. he, the pitch, the pitch he threw before that wasn't very good either. It was, it's just I don't know whether he wasn't ready or, or something, but he threw two pitches that were sort of half-assed, and, and even the catcher, after the first pitch, you know, was 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 exhorting him to, I don't know, throw harder, throw better, throw something, and and of course the next pitch. Thompson hit it out. Well, something yeah, early so in that inning got a lot of play a number of years ago. Alvin Dark led off with a single. Right. And uh, for some reason, Dresson had Hodges hold Dark on with a 3-1 lead. Mm-hmm. And Mueller came up. And Mueller yep. hit a ground ball, which they say would have been a double play had Hodges been playing in his normal position. Uh, yeah, and yet, and little... yet, late in the game, you want to be on the line. I mean, I, I yeah. heard that too. I, I, you know, I you always want to play down the line. Uh, yeah. uh, a bunch of years ago, I asked him about that, and he said, "Well, it was like hunting ducks, and because uh, he, he, he hunting ducks, he said, if uh, he, Hodges wasn't playing normal, he would have tried to hit the ball up the middle." Uh huh. He, sure. He said he really felt he was uh, really, uh, you know, didn't get credit enough for that. It, you talk about yeah. Mueller? Yeah, Mueller, yeah. Yeah, he was Mandrake. This guy had bat control. Yeah. And, um, he did. I, I'll tell, let me tell a quick Mueller-Willie Mays story. Okay. Willie Mays beats out Mueller for the batting championship 
Uh, and I, I'm sure I'm boring Alan with this because you've probably heard it on. No, I've never heard it. So yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, last day of the season, he beats out um, Mueller by like a quarter of a point on the batting average, 343 to 342. And Mueller's sitting there, and um, they ask him, well, what do you think? of?" And Mueller's a slow-footed right fielder, and mm-hmm. Mays is covering for a washed up, not a washed up, but an aging Monty Irvin in left. Right. And it's the biggest outfield in baseball. And Mueller is slower than, than doesn't cover ground. And um, Mueller's in, getting an interview and Mays is sitting there. And, um, and they say, well, and Mueller says, well, I don't feel too badly being beat out by the greatest center fielder in the game. Yeah, and Mueller looks over, and he and Mays looks over. He goes, "The greatest right fielder too." Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> wow! Because he had to cover. Willie had. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, oh, oh that, he was being nasty. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, like, uh, yeah, 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 but in a kind of a kidding way. Well, yeah. In not nasty, nasty. Just uh, uh, Ralph. Ralph, that's nasty. That's nasty. Yeah. We also have left field because. Monty Irvin was at the end, and Dusty Rhodes was lucky every, every time he caught a fly ball. Right. Oh, they were. Uh, that was a flawed team. I um, they, they won it, and but it was really uh, a miracle year in a lot of ways. That well, Al well, Clark uh, came out with a book in the seventies, which I have, and he said, uh, you know, that you know when the series with Cleveland came up. He said, we played them. They used to barnstorm together from the Arizona because in those days, they were only teams training in Arizona. And he used to barnstorm East. And he said, uh, we knew uh, they had no lefty starters. We knew that they were slow on the bases. And we knew that they were weak defensively. So we were. Yeah, yeah, Alvin, Alvin, I have to tell you, Alvin was a son of a bitch. Alvin was a really nasty guy. Not only was underrated he, as a player, though, was he? Yeah. yeah, he was. He was definitely underrated as a player. He hustled like nobody's get out. He was like, like he was a lot like Pedroia is today. But as a human yeah. being, when he was manager, he treated the African American players terribly, absolutely yeah. terribly. And when he was with the Cleveland Indians, when uh, Gabe Paul was the general manager, he did everything he could to get Gabe Paul fired. And finally took over his position, and at that point, absolutely destroyed the Cleveland Indians team with his nonsense to the point where they had to bring Gabe back to save the franchise. Well, Alvin Finley was no, back. Alvin was a bad guy. But Finley brought him back the second time after Dick Williams left, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, most of the players said that they paid no attention to Doc. Yeah, I think seventy. Well, because they hated him so much the first time around. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you know, he was as hypocritical as a human being could get based on what he preached and the way he yes. lived his life. Yes, he was one of those religious religious crackpot guys. Yeah. You know, right. Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus this and which Jesus is, which that. Which is cool if you weren't messing with a stewardess when you were married well, and um, which breaking is, up Which is family. cool if you treated people if you treated people the way Jesus would have treated people. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. No, I and know. Uh, how he would have treated people cannot be found in the Bible because the Bible was written by man years after Jesus died. So his teachings as a Jewish reb, uh, a rabbi, if you will, or just some hippie wandering around helping people for the social cause, being loved, um, isn't – you know, worship the right person, and anyway, that's that's that. So we've had it all tonight. We uh, we've had it all. Had to yes, be we have. Involved in Ralph Branca's conversion to Judaism, we that's had to right. talk about what a real dick Al Dark was, and that's he was. He uh, was on a, a lot of different levels. The A's hated him. A, yep. When um, in '75. I think it was Bando who said he couldn't manage a meat market. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what he said. They, no, yeah. 
they ignored them. They were used to winning. They were used to doing uh, things their own way, and they were able to ignore them. And the reason yeah. they lost in 75 uh, in the uh, LCS is because Catfish Hunter has contracts screwed up by Finley. He was the clear free agent, and the Yankees uh, bought him. Yeah, that was uh, one of the great moments in Yankee history. Yeah. Sports fans. Certainly was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say one more thing. Jim Bouton talks about, yeah. talked about Al Dark. When he was a kid, Jim Bouton yeah. lived in New Jersey. He was a big Yankee. He was a big Giant fan. He came to the Giant Blue fans fan. early right. and all that. And he goes out, he caught a ball and wanted an autograph. And his interaction with Dark was, take a hike, kid. That's what he said. <laughs> yep. That's for sure. But, I know it. So, now with that, and with that, gentlemen, have yes. a wonderful week. Okay. You too, guys. Um, thank you for enriching my life, and um, we'll talk to you both as soon as we do. Okay. Uh, take I'll us take away, Al. Back of the okay. feedback because of the politics of this. Uh, po- negative feedback? Well, yeah. it's better than no feedback at all. Well. Yeah. They'll, love us, they'll love us for our looks. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, guys. Okay, take care. I'll sign off. Take care.